Today what uh, we will do is uh, you know go through uh, some representative CMOS technology and uh, you will recognize that all that we have studied so far is very relevant and it is in fact being implemented in uh, you know state of the art CMOS technology. Uh, so, what I thought I will do is uh, you know walk you through uh, some representative nodes we will start with 180 nanometer generation CMOS technology and then progressively look at uh, scaling look at 130 nanometer 90, 65, 45, 32 you know each one being 0.7 x of the previous technology. Okay. So, let us then uh, start with this what I will do here is essentially I will make use of uh, these papers which are uh, published uh, in uh, conference called IEDM which is an annual conference. Uh, called International Electron Devices Meeting, which is a premier conference in electron devices and uh, any new device technology which gets developed gets reported in these conferences for the first time. Okay. So, what I have done is that I have taken a series of papers published in several past several years, right. we will uh, go through these papers one by one. Uh, of course, we will not really read the entire paper, but I will highlight a few important things to draw your attention to some of the very important uh, technological uh, implementations. Let us look at this uh, paper here now uh, you know which is essentially uh, you know high performance 180 nanometer generation logic technology okay. and uh, uh, just to be consistent you know 180 nanometer technology and all subsequent technologies of course will be implemented by various companies right various uh, foundries right. Uh, just I have picked papers published from Intel just uh, without any bias with to any company, but just to tell you a representative technology and also with respect to their technology Intel's technology we will see how the technology has progressed. Right. So, this is essentially uh, uh, 180 nanometer generation logic technology if you see here. A 180 nanometer generation uh, uh, logic technology has been uh, uh, developed with high performance 140 nanometer gate length transistor. You see I told you that the so called technology node, but the gate lengths of the transistor could be less than the technology node. right? So, this technology node is 180 nanometer however, the gate length of the transistor is actually 140 nanometer. It has 6 layers of aluminum interconnects right the interconnect in this technology is still aluminum however, later on you will see that they have migrated from aluminum to copper okay, in terms of the interconnect. And uh, the dielectric between interconnects which is multi level in metal interconnect if you recall we had discussed this in our CMOS process flow between one metal level to the other metal level you have an insulator. And that insulator is silicon oxide except that it is little bit variant of silicon oxide it is fluorine doped silicon oxide. The idea of doing doping it with fluorine is to reduce the dielectric constant of silicon oxide okay. that is why they say it is a low epsilon epsilon is a dielectric constant because in the interconnects you want to minimize the parasitic capacitances parasitic resistances and hence you need to minimize the capacitances this is opposite of high k gate dielectric these are low k gate dielectrics. Okay. So, you minimize the interconnect delay and interconnect capacitances. The transistors are optimized for a reduced 1.3 to 1.5 volt operation you see the transistors operate at low voltage right at 1.5 volt maximum not beyond that. <laughs> right, the interconnects feature high aspect ratio uh, metal lines and all that and using this technology they have demonstrated a 16 bit SRAM with certain uh, you know uh, memory cell size okay. and this is sort of a demonstration of the technology. Right. What they are showing here is that not only they have developed the transistors, but they have put together a transistor to make a circuit and in this case the circuit is static random access memory which is a representative circuit. Eventually in this technology is a logic technology you see here logic technology not a memory technology uh, logic technology will be used to build microprocessors which are very high end logic chips, but microprocessors on chip will have cache memory right. So, these SRAMs will be used for cache memories in the microprocessors these are not going to be standalone SRAM chips to be sold. Okay. So, they have been able to demonstrate that SRAM circuit can also be implemented using this technology. Okay. So, let us then uh, just uh, go through some uh, key uh, uh, highlights here. Okay. 
and you know they give the introduction why do you need uh, you know scaling and all that right that is very uh, typical right. Now, let us come to the transistor right. So, the transistor is sort of illustrated in this figure right you have uh, CMOS technology right you have n channel and p channel transistor right figure 1 illustrates the structure of the MOS transistor and isolation used in this technology. The isolation as you know is a shallow trench isolation correct not a low cost isolation you have made a trench inside the silicon and that isolates the neighboring transistors. Okay, start with the p minus p plus epitaxial silicon wafers followed by the formation of shallow trench isolation. N wells are formed with deep phosphorus and shallow arsenic implants they have not used uh, in this particular case uh, antimony and indium yet. Okay. But nonetheless they use phosphorus and arsenic combination for N well while p wells are formed with boron implants okay, that is how they are forming these wells. Okay. And, uh, Then you know they also have uh, uh, the electrical gate oxide thickness is 3 nanometer uh, gate oxide what they show here is a electrical thickness when we talk of CV characterization subsequently from next class we will see what is the difference between physical thickness and electrical thickness. Electrical thickness is always little more than physical thickness. So, if they are saying 3 nanometer is their electrical thickness, their physical thickness could be something like 2 nanometer, okay, less than 3 nanometer for sure. <coughs> and uh, they have ensured that this dielectric has realized sufficient reliability as uh, you know they will demonstrate and uh, their gate lengths have been patterned using uh, deep UV lithography, it is an optical lithography essentially. Okay. Shallow source drain extensions, remember all that we talked about in terms of source drain engineering. They have used solar source drain extension with the arsenic for NMOS, boron for PMOS. These are source drain extension for N channel and P channel transistors. Halo implants boron and arsenic are used in both cases for improved short channel characteristics. Low N plus P plus junction capacitance values uh, you know uh, that is fine. Side wall spacers are formed using CVD nitride right remember the nitride spacer that we talked about that is in fact used to isolate uh, deep source drain junction from your shallow extensions right they make use of that. They use silicide titanium silicide remember the parasitic region that we talked about uh, after the gating of the transistor there is a contact and in between there is a silicon and if you convert it into a silicide you get lower resistivity and in this technology they are using titanium silicide. Okay. So, that the uh, typical on polys and source drain regions with a normal sheet resistance of 3 ohm per square okay. that is the kind of sheet resistance that you can get which is a very low sheet resistance by the way. Okay. Okay. So, hence this is how the cross section uh, would look you see there is a n channel transistor in a p well there is a deep source drain there is a shallow extension there is a spacer which separates the two and there is a silicide here and similarly silicide will be on poly as well as on this junction and this is a p p, mono, p mos transistor right you know complementary uh, metal oxide silicon technology right so this is how you would uh, define the transistor and then you will have to characterize a lot of things right you will have to make sure that the isolation is sufficient right for that you need to characterize the breakdown voltage of these uh, you know that is between this and this right. If you apply 2 volt it does it should not break down you know the breakdown voltage should be more like you know 5 10 volt right. So, for all practical purposes these two are perfectly isolated ok. So, they are essentially demonstrating all these uh, characteristics. You know you can go back and go through these papers these papers are certainly available if you are an IEEE member or if your institute is subs subscribing IEEE journals you will certainly have this uh, uh, listed uh, in the IEEE publication. Hmm. <coughs> One other important aspect that we had discussed all these uh, reliability issues remember I said when you do the gate oxide reliability there is something called TDDB which is time dependent dielectric breakdown. Uh, even though you are going to operate your transistor at very low electric field such as maybe in this case 6 uh, mega volt per centimeter right you what you do is that you apply large electric field and characterize the breakdown times and based on that you sort of extrapolate it and say that ok in the real use condition certainly this will be reliable up to 10 years 
ok. They have done a similar thing what we have discussed right. These are typical reliability characterizations ok. And here they show <coughs> typical n channel and p channel characteristics. This is drain current versus drain voltage the so called output characteristics which are well behaved going up to 1.5 volt for n MOS and minus 1.5 volt for p channel transistor. Of course, your n current is more than the p current because of the electron mobility being higher than the hole mobility ok. This is sub threshold characteristics. Huh? Your threshold voltage is you know about uh, 0.5 volt or so and uh, below that this is a IDS in log scale and VGS in li linear scale right. It is a semi log plot really huh? and this really is a sub threshold slope as we have already discussed. And again notice that depending on whether you have 0 0.05 volt here or 1.5 volt here you will have different characteristics uh, that is essentially due to the Dibble effect drain induced barrier lowering. If you have larger drain voltage for the same gate voltage you get larger current because your drain electric field will influence the injection at the source side especially in these nanometric dimension transistors ok. So, this is just to show that your polysilicon gate because of the silicidation has reasonably low resistivity right. Sheet resistance is of the order of 3 to 4 ohm per square which is fairly good. These are typical V t versus length plots remember what our discussion there is a reverse short channel effect. I told you whenever you use a halo invariably you will have reverse short channel effects huh? and then usual uh, uh, V t roll off that you will have. Uh, you know in this uh, region here right this region here V t is coming down. This is V t measured at 1.5 volt on the drain and this is V t measured at 0 0.05 volt on the drain and this difference is essentially your dibble right. V t at uh, low voltage on the drain is always higher than V t at high voltage on the drain right your dibble can be characterized based on that ok. So, <coughs> they have uh, N MOS and P MOS devices which have a sub threshold slope of 90 millivolt per decade. Remember 60 is the best you can get, but you will never get 60 because you have 1 plus C D over C aux term which is always more than 1 right. So, because of that it will be more than 60. So, they have been able to achieve 90 millivolt per decade and their off currents are of the order of 3 nano ampere per micrometer we always specify off current in terms of ampere per width unit width hmm? depending on how many microns your transistor width is you multiply that you get the uh, off state current. And your uh, on state current uh, saturation drive currents are 0.94 milliampere for N MOS and 0.42 milliampere for P MOS ok. So, in other words your um, on current you know to off current ratio is almost 10 power 6. It was if it were to be 10 power 6 then it would have been 3 milliampere here, but it is not 3 milliampere it is close to 1 milliampere correct ok which is reasonably good on current to off current ratio. This is N MOS this is P MOS same story reverse short channel effect and typical V T roll off the V T's are negative again lower drain voltage higher drain voltage ok. <coughs> okay, short channel threshold voltage roll off are shown in these figures right threshold voltages at 1.5 volt drain bias are 0.3 volt for N MOS huh? and minus 0.24 volt for P MOS ok. And, uh, these results are of course, better than any previously published bulk or SOI devices you know they are trying to say that you know they have been able to come up with much better devices. Subsequently, they have also made use of these transistor and built what is called a ring oscillator and from that they extract inverter gate delay. If you were to build a simple inverter a NOT gate what is the gate propagation delay? Uh, you have a input uh, transition from low to high how long does it take for output to go from high to low? that is your propagation delay and uh, they have been able to get uh, the propagation delay and typically you know it is very difficult to measure propagation delays of the order of uh, you know these propagation delays that they have are of the order of uh, few picoseconds 
uh, so you do not construct just one single inverter uh, because if you want to construct one single inverter you will have to measure the time resolution of the order of picoseconds. What you do is that you cascade the inverters uh, a large number of inverters are in series very interestingly if you have an odd number of inverters in series and connect the output of the last inverter back to the input of the first inverter create a feedback circuit that starts working as an oscillator uh, that is why it is called a ring oscillator ring meaning you have connect created an inverter ring uh, you need to have an odd number of inverter otherwise it will go to if you have even number of inverter it will go to a steady state right input will also be steady output will also be steady but if you have an odd number of inverter you can do this exercise yourself output will try to change the input and you know it will keep changing right it will become a oscillatory circuit so you do this oscillator you measure the oscillators time period and you know how many stages of inverters you have and you back calculate the delay per inverter okay and that is what is done typically and they do it for unloaded ring oscillator meaning there is no extra load on the oscillator the only load is the subsequent inverter stage okay operating at 1.3 and 1.5 at room temperature they have been able to get very low uh, you know uh, delays of the ring oscillators <coughs> we will come to this uh, in a minute but this is typically what is uh, plotted gate delay as a function of gate length if you have a long transistor your delays are also more that is why we are scaling right i mean the reason why we scale is that the circuit starts operating faster as we have discussed in the very beginning as you start shrinking this um, gate length the gate length is decreasing here the delay is also decreasing uh, and the nominal gate length for this technology is of the order of uh, 150 nanometer and at 150 nanometer your gate delays are of the order of 10 picosecond uh, again if you operate this at lower voltage your delay is little longer little more uh, and if you apply higher voltage for this circuit not very high i mean if you uh, apply very high voltage you will break down okay then you can decrease the delay a little further ok. <coughs> One good uh, way of benchmarking the transistors is to really plot this uh, so called DC performance metric ok. What is DC performance metric? This is a XY plot with on current on the x axis and off current on the y axis ok. And the requirement for a good transistor is that for any given off current whatever that off current is that right let us say 10 nanometer off current I want to be furthest right of this curve. If you have two technologies for example, if I have a new technology which looks like this, this is much better transistor because for the same leakage current it is giving you much much better on state current right on state current is much larger so your on to off current ratio is huge so that it will be less leaky it will not consume large static power at the same time it will be very fast right so it's essentially a 2d plot of off current versus on current and you want to really uh, create your transistor to really go along this uh, you know uh, towards the right and of course, N MOS tends to be for the same leakage current to the right of P MOS simply because you have much better electron hole mobility compared to uh, hole mobility ok. But what they are trying to do here is that the field simple they say this work and there are some previous works you know from references these are empty symbols. So, what they have plotted here is that these empty symbols are to the left of P all these are P MOS transistors from previously published papers and all these empty symbols here are n MOS transistors from previously published papers. And all they are trying to say is that compared to previously published PMOS devices these are much better because for the same off current your curve is to the right and you get much higher on current ok and that is what you want to uh, generate. The way you generate this curve by the way if you want to generate such a curve you cannot generate this curve with a one gate length transistor uh, what you do is that you the using the same technology you print transistors of different gate lengths gate lengths from 130 nanometer 150 nanometer 200 nanometer 300 nanometer so on and so forth as your gate length is increasing 
your leakage current decreases, your on current also decreases. So, all these points here you see correspond to shorter gate length because these are large on current and large off current. All these points here correspond to a longer gate length p channel transistor and that is how you generate series of these points by characterizing transistors of different dimensions and you plot a universal curve which is a off current versus on current curve. Similarly, for n channel transistors these are uh, okay, the transistors which have very high on current and off current which are coming from very short channel 130 nanometer kind of transistor whereas, along this these are longer channel transistors okay, and that is how this is generated. And they do the interconnects, uh, you know, interconnect is essentially aluminum in this case, they have not yet used uh, copper, okay. Uh, but the only thing that they have done different in interconnects is to use uh, fluorinated silicon oxide, as I mentioned earlier uh, here. Okay. You see fluorine is added to a silicon oxide to reduce dielectric constant and improve interconnect performance. The use of SiOF as an interlevel dielectric reduces the dielectric constant to 3.55 compared to 4.1 for undoped silicon oxide. Right? Remember silicon oxide the dielectric constant is around 4, 4.1 right? and whereas, whereas that comes down to 3.55. Hmm? Uh, you see thermal oxide if oxide is grown at let us say high temperature 1000 degree centigrade then its dielectric constant is more like 3.9 uh, that is what we used earlier when we were talking of gate dielectric 3.9 we round it off to 4. But here we say 4.1 because this oxide is not thermally grown it is a deposited oxide because you already have a metal line and top of metal line you have to put oxide. So, there is no silicon to grow oxide you will have to do a chemical vapor deposition of the oxide uh, and invariably these oxides which are done at low temperature because you already have a metal tend to have little higher dielectric constant and hence the dielectric constant is of the order of 4.1. After fluorine doping it comes all the way down to 3.55. Okay. <coughs> okay. So, they actually build a SRAM cell this is the cross section I mean not cross section the top view of the SRAM cell wherein you have 6 transistors this is a 6 transistor SRAM cell this is their interconnect stack you know starting from the transistor at the very bottom these are the contacts metal 1, via 1, metal 2, via 2, metal 3, via 4, metal 4 and so on and so forth going up to 6 levels of metals in this case. And uh, you know using all this they have been able to show a working SRAM and uh, you know this is what they are sort of summarizing 180 nanometer generation logic technology has been developed and demonstrated with high performance reduced power transistors aluminum interconnects with low epsilon silicon uh, oxide with fluorine doping dielectrics are used to meet interconnect density and performance requirement. The technology yield and performance capabilities have been demonstrated on a 16 megabit SRAM which operates at greater than 900 megahertz frequency. Uh, so, eventually if you have to build a microprocessor if the cache has to respond at that frequency it would respond at that frequency right. So, they have been able to start from the basic semiconductor processes using all the process integration you know build the transistors demonstrate a simple circuit like ring oscillator characterize the gate delay and take it forward to make an SRAM cell and show that the SRAM is working right. So, this is really a demonstration of a technology, but still this technology is still not after this it may take another year for you to make a real product okay? you, because your real product is going to be microprocessor subsequently right. Then you will have to make a microprocessor make sure that the yield is good right and you know that requires lot of optimization. Okay. So, let us now look at uh, uh, the subsequent uh, technology which is uh, 
you know the 130 nanometer uh, okay generation logic again logic technology right because intel doesn't make standalone memories right the only uh, product they offer and that is their essentially lifeline is microprocessors very high end microprocessors right and hence this is the logic technology not a memory technology again uh. now 70 nanometer transistors although it's a 130 nanometer technology you see the gate length is 70 nanometer they have dual vt transistors remember something that we discussed uh, there is a leakage power problem you need to really make sure that you minimize the leakage power at the same time you need high performance. So, what do you do? It turns out there are only a few critical parts in any complicated chip. It is important to make the transistors in the critical part very fast transistors and hence make only those transistors a low VT transistors and others could be high VT transistors right. So, as a result of that you get very fast chip as well as low power consuming chip. So, in other words here you have two flavors of n channel transistors and two flavors of p channel transistors. One is called a low V t transistor and the other one is called a high V t transistor and hence it is a dual V t transistor technology. And what else? Six layers copper interconnects a big departure now from aluminum to copper because this is the only way to scale the interconnects very briefly maybe we will look at uh, the issues in interconnect scaling. Well, let us get started uh, you know what they have here. <coughs> a leading edge 130 nanometer generation logic technology with 6 layers of dual damascene copper interconnects. Dual damascene is a particular process sequence which is used to realize copper interconnects right. We will not really go over the details of that process sequence. Dual VT transistors are employed with 1.5 nanometer thick gate oxide. The gate oxide thickness has gone down compared to what it was in the previous generation operating at 1.3 volt previously it was 1.5 maximum now it is 1.3 you see high vt transistors have drive currents of 1 milli ampere and 0.5 milli ampere per micron for nmos and pmos while low vt transistors have 1.17 for nmos and 0.6 for pmos respectively so two flavors of transistors <coughs> Again they have been able to make an SRAM cell, demonstrated SRAM cell, uh, demonstrated the technology on a 18 bit SRAM. <coughs> okay. the, the you know typical process flow is the same thing except that you have a two dual VT meaning you will have to create two different N wells, two different P wells. Uh, so, that doping concentration is little different in two N wells and little different in two P wells and that is how you get uh, uh, dual VT technology for N and P which means more photolithography step little more complex technology, but that is worth it only if you do that you would be able to get the best of it ok. okay so, various uh, uh, technological features this is how a transistor looks n channel transmission electron micrograph of showing a 70 nanometer gate length source drain ultra thin gate electrode you know polysilicon silicided at the top and so on and so forth ok. All else will remain identical you will use halo you will use shallow extension you know except that you may change the dose because the transistor gate length is going down especially halo dose you may want to manipulate ok. Shallow source drain extension regions are formed with arsenic for NMOS boron for PMOS boron and arsenic halos are used this will be remain same ok. Uh, silicon nitride is used for the spacer correct followed by H -pack. the silicide here is cobalt silicide as opposed to titanium silicide. Cobalt silicide gives you much better lower resistance compared to titanium silicide ok. okay. Again the demonstrator well behaved NMOS and PMOS right the story looks similar right you know you will see similar graphs here uh, except that now you have a high VT and low VT two flavors uh, ok. And sub threshold plot drain current in a log scale versus gate voltage ok for low drain voltage and high drain voltage uh, and uh, 
the dibble for the 70 nanometer NMOS device is measured to be 100 millivolt per volt that is how we specify the dibble right. What is the difference in Vt per unit voltage on the drain unit voltage change on the drain huh? and that is how they are characterizing the dibble and uh, this is again the typical off current versus on current right and they are sort of saying that okay, you know this uh, again two flavors unfilled and filled high Vt and low Vt there are two flavors of PMOS and two flavors of n, n channel transistors ok. These are some important metrics uh, such as VDD, gate length, oxide thickness you know they are comparing 180 nanometer generation which is a previous paper that we discussed and this generation supply voltage from 1.5 to 1 1.3, gate length from 130 to 70, oxide thickness from 2 nanometer to 1.5 nanometer and so on and so forth ok. You see off current has increased a little bit from 3 to 10 nano ampere per micron ok. Typical threshold voltage roll off, threshold voltage versus gate length, n channel, p channel, n channel positive and p channel negative Vt, low drain voltage, high drain voltage this is because of dibble ok. This is now high Vt and this is the low Vt uh, transistor. So, again they characterize delay the bing, uh, ring oscillator. Now, they have depicted in slightly different fashion in the previous paper you saw delay plotted against gate length here delay is plotted against off state current of a transistor. Remember off state current is inversely related to gate length. Huh? In other words, if you had to plot gate length here, this would have been a lower gate length maybe 100 nanometer here, maybe 200 nanometer here, maybe 500 nanometer here ok. 500 nanometer will also have, I am sorry <laughs> I got it the other way around ok. This would be 100 nanometer ok, this would be, let me see if I can delete this uh, ok. Yeah, let me just take it away. Uh, okay, that's okay. So this needs to be sort of reversed. Okay. Uh, okay. Right. Hundred nanometer is out here. Okay. 100 nanometer also results in large leakage current ok. Longer channel length also results in small leakage current correct I mean let me write it here. So, that becomes very clear. So, this is 100 nanometer transistor let us say 100 or 170 nanometer in this case right they have gone down to 70 nanometer right. So, this would be uh, something like 70 nanometer uh, out here ok and this may be 100 nanometer and this may be 200 nanometer. So, the gate length is the lowest here and the lowest gate length gives the lowest delay and when the gate length is increasing the leakage current also decreases as is evident here lower leakage current. Because you have larger gate length the current on current will also be lower just as off current is decreasing on current is also decreasing and hence you will get larger delays correct. It is essentially you know looking at this delay versus gate length or delay versus leakage current you know one one and the same essentially. So, chip performance is increasingly limited by the RC delay of the interconnect. Now, why is that? <coughs> Let us look at what is happening with scaling right. What have we done over scaling you know we have started from uh, let us say uh, technology of the order of 250 nanometer quarter micron technology 180 nanometer 130 right 90 65 ok 45 and so on and so forth right. And let us look at what happens to delay. We know that as I scale transistor, transistor becomes very efficient. In other words if we are talking of gate delay or inverter delay. Uh, over the technology generation inverter delay or gate delay has been decreasing and that is why in the first place we want to scale. Uh, 
uh, you build any gate it could be a not gate and gate or what have you right. So, so, so called gate delay decreases gate delay decreases because remember gate delay depends on transistors and transistors with scaling become efficient smaller transistors are always better and the so called C V over I metric becomes better as I start scaling down the transistor. What is the story with interconnects? Interconnects it turns out the story is completely opposite unfortunately. Huh? What is an interconnect? You know interconnect is a metal line ok. Let us say this is metal 2 and there may be another neighboring metal 2 line here. Huh? This is another line running at the same level and let us say there is another metal 1 underneath m 1 between these two you have inter level dielectric two metal levels be be between that you have a dielectric huh? that is how you have insulated correct. This is metal 1 what is scaling of interconnects scaling of interconnects is scaling the dimensions of the interconnect just as scaling of the transistor transistor dimension has to come down and transistor distance has to come down and same here with the interconnects right the interconnect the dimension has to come down. Hmm. What is the dimension? You see this is the so called line width we call it line width we print the metal line metal line is a long metal line hmm. how long it, it is it depends on where is this metal going from in a chip from one location to the other location in a chip. This is the thickness let us say T and this is length. Okay. Let us normalize the length unfortunately the chips are not becoming small the chips are really becoming bigger and bigger. <laughs> you would have thought that with scaling because you are trying to bring down the number of transistor the chip should become smaller right uh, that is why we said 0.7 x so that the chip area comes down transistor area comes down and all that. But what has happened over the years is that with scaling we also put in more transistors in a new technology we are not just happy with the performance gain that comes just because of the mere scaling. Uh, we want to increase the number of transistors very significantly compared to what it was earlier. Okay. So, if previously you had million transistors you want to put 4 million transistors in a new chip in a new technology and hence you continue to use the same area or even bigger area. Okay. So, in other words if you are looking at a chip uh, the chip size from one technology to the other technology really does not scale if anything it is becoming bigger the chips are becoming bigger. Huh? What is interconnect interconnect is essentially a metal line which takes the signal from one location to the other location in a chip you see. Huh? So, the message here is that the length wise it is not really helping us you know it is really becoming as big. So, let us look at normalized length what happens with the interconnect scaling what happens to what is interconnect delay interconnect delay depends on r and c of the interconnect this is a rc delay due to interconnects scaling i need to scale the width i need to scale t if i go from this technology to a new technology of metal interconnect in that the thickness has come down the width has come down what is the implication resistance goes up because your cross section area for conduction is going down. So, per unit length you see if you were to look at ask the question what is resistance per unit length right uh, right what is a L rho L by A let us say I am interested in R per L it is rho by A hmm. how is A scaling right A has T and W ok. As a result your interconnect resistance per unit length goes up as k square <laughs> which is not a good thing ok. This is not the end of the story. So, the message is that interconnect lines are becoming more resistive with scaling not the end of the story there is even more serious problem and what is that serious problem you would have thought that at least because I am making the interconnect smaller the capacitance should go down ok because capacitance should be due to let us say this metal line and another metal line 
there is a coupling capacitance uh, and the area for that coupling is T I mean this uh, uh, you know that is determined by this width that is coming down and hence it should go down. Yes, this the so called uh, parallel plate capacitance or inter metal capacitance indeed goes down, but there is a more serious issue and what is that? I am also decreasing the distance between the two metal lines in the new generation of the technology. So, the new generation of the technology has M2 lines which were far apart have been brought very close to each other. So, there is a new capacitive component which is intra layer capacitance earlier this distance was very large you could have ignored that capacitance. Now, this is increasing very dramatically. So, net result is that with scaling your R is increasing your C is also increasing as far as interconnects are concerned. C is increasing very dramatically because these interconnects lines are coming close to each other okay. and hence the RC delay of the interconnects is increasing. So, if you were to look at interconnects in older generation technology 250 nanometer and beyond interconnects were afterthought you never bothered about interconnects they are ideal metal lines take signal from one location to the other location it do they do not contribute any further delay. So, it was non existent compared to gate delay your interconnect delay was very very low, but what has happened in the recent past is something like this your gate delays are increasing your interconnect delays are increasing and hence interconnects are becoming bottlenecks right. It is like you know just imagine your road network in the city you have the fastest driving car okay, and that is transistor for you that is a gate for you, but you know you have a very bad road network then you are limited not by the speed of the car, but you are limited how fast the roads will allow you to travel. Right, and these are the roads interconnects are the road that allows you to take signals from one location to other location and that has become a serious problem and hence you see that in this technology there are a lot of things that are being done to minimize R and to minimize C. In previous paper we saw fluorine was doped to minimize capacitance and today I mean in this technology we see aluminum is replaced with copper because copper has lower resistance compared to aluminum RC delay becomes much better and that is exactly what is done here ok. <coughs> and they have optimized this fluorinated oxide and that gives a k of about 3.6 and uh, this is again the hierarchy of interconnects and they have used this to uh, build uh, ok what they are showing here is that if they had used aluminum you see with decreasing pitch decreasing pitches two metals are coming closer to each other your delays are increasing if you had used aluminum it would have gone up like this because you use copper you could decrease it ok. At the same pitch copper technology gives much lower delay compared to aluminum technology hmm? and that is what they have done and they have been able to make an SRAM and demonstrate that you know 18 bit SRAM is operating now at what 1.6 megahertz much higher uh, uh, frequency ok ok right. So, ok actually uh, I, I it is not very clear here you know uh, I take back what I said I mean the previous uh, one was a lower density SRAM was at 900 megahertz, but this is a higher density SRAM you know that is operating at little lower frequency you know as you start increasing the density there is also an impact on the you know speed of the uh, the SRAM that you can build. Whereas, the ring oscillators obviously are much more efficient compared to the basic technology is much better previous generation was 10 picosecond 10 to 13 picosecond now it is a 7 picosecond right. So, you know you can clearly see a better technology and if you go down to 90 nanometer now what has happened now? 7 layers 6 layers have become 7 layers of copper 90 nanometer has a 50 nanometer gate length transistors ok. From 70 it came down to 50 nanometer now it has it is using a strained silicon channel we, we have not discussed about strained silicon channel 
but uh, very soon down the line you will start discussing uh, you know strained silicon also. So, we will postpone that discussion for, for the time being. Hmm? Uh, this uses 1.2 nanometer oxide, it is even thinner than previous generation and uh, nickel silicide instead of cobalt silicide it is nickel silicide. Now, there is a you know some more uh, optimization and uh, so <coughs> this is the cross section of a transistor channel is strained silicon 1.2 nanometer gate oxide 50 nanometer gate length nickel silicide is shown here at the source drain and at the polysilicon. Hmm. And they have been able to make a 60 SRAM cell using the technology right this here just shows that you have silicon and 1.2 nanometer oxide and you know uh, polysilicon gate ok. And typical off current versus on current for N and P channel transistors ok. And, uh, they are just showing here you know as a function of year different technology nodes. We already looked at 180 nanometer technology 130 nanometer in 180 nanometer you had uh, 100 nanometer 130 nanometer 70 nanometer gate length 90 nanometer 50 nanometer gate length this is what I said. Now, we have a departure in terms of what gate length you print is mo actually smaller than the so called technology definition 90 nanometer, but in the past they were exactly identical ok. We have had a discussion on this in the uh, one of the earlier lectures. Hmm. Why nickel silicide? Because with scaling cobalt silicide, silicide will start increasing the resistance whereas, nickel silicide gives very low resistance and that is why they have gone to nickel silicide ok. Again multi level metal interconnects now instead of fluorine doped oxide they have done carbon doped oxide you know again uh, a uh, new improvement uh, you know that is how you need new new and newer and newer materials k has come down to 2.9 instead of 3.5 again to decrease the rc delay of your uh, metal interconnects okay and uh, they again show that with carbon doped oxide you can get significantly lower rc delay as you start decreasing the pitch as compared to aluminum oxide with fluorine doped oxide aluminum with fluorine doped oxide copper with fluorine doped oxide and this is copper with carbon doped oxide ok which is much better. And they have been able to uh, do an SRAM here and this SRAM operates at uh, you know uh, 2 gigahertz ok which is much higher uh, frequency ok. I suspect that you know the previous paper that probably should have been 1.6 gigahertz that could be a typo there you know rather than 1.6 megahertz you know that is more like it because on 180 nanometer you had a you know 900 megahertz very close to gigahertz right and you know then you have uh, 1.6 gigahertz and now you have about 2 gigahertz or little more than 2 gigahertz ok. So, this is about uh, 90 nanometer and if you come to 65 nanometer all that has happened really is gate length has, has scaled down further 35 nanometer. 8 levels of copper interconnects, interconnect hierarchy is also becoming more complex and SRAM cell is also shrinking. Hmm. Continue to use nickel silicide ok and uh, let us see if there is anything that I want uh, to highlight here. Uh, ok. So, this is a typical trend right. Uh, so, on a 65 nanometer technology the gate lengths are 35 nanometer. This is a typical cross section of a transistor ok N and P channel transistor ID VDS characteristics and uh, sub threshold characteristics. This is uh, off current uh, versus on current typical uh, DC performance metric ok. And, uh, this is uh, the same for PMOS transistor. Uh, this is a very nice cross section showing different levels of metal interconnects ok. And uh, ok they have made an SRAM uh, this is a 70 megabit SRAM test vehicle and they have been able to you know uh, show that this SRAM operates at uh, frequencies. Uh, uh, close to 2 gigahertz right and that they have been able to demonstrate right. No major departures 
then at 45 nanometer you see very significant departure and what is that for the first time you see high k uh, gate dielectrics along with metal gate okay here high k metal gate for the first time 45 nanometer logic technology and uh, transistors feature 1 nanometer EOT uh, that is equivalent oxide thickness, but they actually use a hafnium oxide gate dielectric which is thicker than 1 nanometer. Uh, they use a high k gate dielectric dual band edge work function metal gates two different metals one for n channel one for p channel transistors. Okay. Uh, <coughs> So, what they have been able to show here is the following. Okay. Uh, you see uh, this is gate leakage here okay, and this is oxide thickness EOT. Uh, when you use SiO2 EOT and SiO2 are one and the same. Okay. You see from uh, previous uh, this is a 45 nanometer generation at 65 nanometer generation they were not able to scale the gate oxide thickness because the leakage current as we started decreasing the gate oxide thickness leakage current suddenly started increasing because of direct tunneling current. And because from 90 nanometer to 65 nanometer they did not have a mature high k gate dielectric technology they could not scale the oxide thickness they kept the oxide thickness as is and then the leakage current kept was you know kept at the same time same level. Now, with the high k technology the EOT came down, but the leakage did not increase the leakage also came down right because it is a EOT of uh, 1 nanometer, but indeed it is a thicker physical oxide direct tunneling is suppressed and hence you got the best of the world right you got lower EOT and lower leakage current that is why you want to use high k gate dielectric. Mm, that is illustrated very nicely here showing the trends in different uh, technologies. Okay. <coughs> mm. So, this is a high k and uh, metal gate is different for NMOS and PMOS. Okay. Uh, okay. So, what is the typical process flow they do a STI shallow trench isolation wells and adjust the VTs the deposit high k gate dielectric using atomic layer deposition. ALD is atomic layer deposition of that dielectric they do a disposable gate uh, metal gate remember the discussion that we had. So, polysilicon is done as usual gate patterning source drain extension spacers everything is done source drain formation nickel silicidation and then you deposit an insulator then poly opening you etch back the poly okay. poly is removed that is what we mean by disposable metal gate uh, poly was sitting there as a placeholder. So, that you get self aligned transistors then you do one metal for PMOS transistor which has a work function appropriate with P channel transistor do patterning of the gate and then again do a N MOS work function metal deposition you need two metals for defining two different kinds of transistor hmm? and you know you complete the uh, transistors and then of course, you do the met multi level metal interconnects. Hmm. So, this is again to show that with high k your gate leakage has come down very dramatically uh, if you had used the uh, silicon oxide or even so called nitride silicon oxide you would have had a very high leakage current, but now that is not the case. This is the typical V t versus gate length threshold voltage roll off that we have seen measured at low drain voltage and high drain voltage. That is for n channel and this is for p channel transistors okay. typical off current versus on current plots right. So, this looks similar everything looks similar and now typical delay versus off current remember this is how it looks when you have very large off current it means the smallest length transistor has the highest leakage current and hence because you have built the inverter using the smallest length transistor you have the best delay that you can get. And the delays are now of the order of you know very low delays of 5 picoseconds or even less than 5 picoseconds hmm? okay. reliability of the transistors again they have characterized TDDB. 
by accelerated testing you know extrapolation right just to show that these high k gate dielectrics are as reliable as silicon oxide ok. Then they have actually <coughs> made uh, not only SRAM in this case they have actually made a microprocessor they have made a single core microprocessor and dual core microprocessor ok and been able to show that you know you can actually get a fairly good uh, circuit uh, working uh, with all these new technologies high k metal gate and so on and so forth right and that is what happened in 45 nanometer technology and in 32 nanometer technology you know the high k and metal gate continued right it continues to be high k and metal gate transistors right we have stuck to that right now going forward we will continue to use high k and metal gate huh? but it is called second generation of high k and they have tried to do some optimization improve the hafnium oxide performance improve the metal gate performance and so on and so forth huh? right so 32 nanometer the actual gate length is you know uh, much lower than uh, a little lower than not much lower than little lower than 32 nanometer Hmm. You know, this is just showing that previous generation technology, you know, this is a 32 nanometer technology and uh, off current versus on current, the typical plots that we have seen, huh? all these are off current versus on current plots, right? So, trying to indicate that they have been able to optimize this transistor for a gi given off current, they have been able to get as large on current as possible, ok. typical uh, output characteristics I V D I D S versus V D S notice that the difference between N and P has come down if you recall 180 nanometer technology your P channel current was almost 50 percent of the N channel current. Now, using the so called strain engineering which as I said will be discussed in one of the future classes we are able to enhance both electron and hole mobilities and so much so that the hole mobility can approach very close to electron mobility uh, and that is why you do not see a huge difference between electron and hole mobility and electron and hole current n channel and p channel current ok. The difference has come down this is a typical sub threshold plot that you would see and uh, typical V t versus length plot V t is decreasing with decreasing channel length right. So, all these is consistent with what we have been discussing and they have again made an SRAM and uh, they demonstrate that you know SRAM works uh, fairly well uh, with this 32 nanometer technology right. So, what we have been able to do uh, in this lecture is really to look at uh, representative CMOS logic technologies not memory technology. These technologies are not for DRAM fabrication not for flash memory fabrication not for even SRAM fabrication, but to make a very high performance microprocessors ok. So, there the performance is the key you want to make the transistor which gives the lowest delay and various techniques we have seen right all the source drain engineering channel engineering is consistently used in all these transistors. And as we have continued to scale the technologies we have transitioned from silicon oxide to high k gate dielectrics to metal gates and so on and so forth. Similarly, in the interconnect arena we have gone from aluminum and conventional silicon oxide to doped silicon oxide copper and thereby minimize the R C delay of the interconnects very significantly right. So, hopefully now you know you should be able to read up any CMOS technology paper and be able to understand that you know based on all the discussion that we have had so far. So, we will uh, stop this uh, lecture today and uh, starting from next lecture we will actually start looking at electrical characterization that is C V characterization and I V characterization ok.